The Build Show Build Boston series is sponsored by Alora Fiber Cement Siding, Mitsubishi Electric Train US, Roseburg, Shuko USA, and Warmboard. Hey, Build Show. Steve Basic, architect. Yeah, we're out here. Build Show Build Boston. It's my favorite time of the year. It's, uh, I would say, damn near perfect weather, right? Gets a little chilly at night, nice and sunny during the day. Perfect construction weather. Well, hopefully you enjoyed the last episode where we talked about plaster. You know, Mike just did, he did a really good job. Probably one of the best guys where I've ever just walked up and uh, talked for, you know, almost an hour on camera with him. Just very knowledgeable. And the fact that he's fourth generation, that's crazy. If you haven't seen it, go back, check it out. And if you haven't seen any of the previous episodes, I suggest go back there, all exciting stuff. But today we're moving forward. Today we got Glenn inside from Custom Woodwork. He's gonna do all of the interior trim here. He's already got some stuff mocked up. We're gonna jump in there. We're gonna catch up with him. He's gonna outline it. And then we're gonna jump over and we're gonna to talk to the painters and we're gonna talk about how they prep and how they get ready to make this place look spectacular. It's a real exciting part of the project now because pretty much everything we do from today is stuff that you're gonna see and touch and hold and grab. So real exciting stuff. All the stuff up until today, we got it buried in the wall. So anyways, let's get inside, let's catch up with Glenn and let's talk interior trim. we said we're going to jump right in we're going to go see the millwork we're going to hang some doors and all of that but before we do that i want to make sure that we shot a quick video here um you know pocket doors i probably put in at least two or three of them in almost every project everybody's always oh can we put pocket doors i get some clients you know hey we want pocket doors everywhere and you know pocket doors have a history of maybe not being um, as reliant as a hinge door, but uh, we've used cavity sliders a lot on different projects. They're a, a really good, reliable source on hardware for pocket doors, right? You could buy the same slab, the same slabs that we're putting everywhere else. We can put in here, it's just the guts. And we had to shoot this video before our drywall video, obviously, because you wouldn't be able to see the mechanics of the pocket door and what's behind the scenes unless we shot it before. So you're kind of getting a little sneak peek before we shoot it. So as I talked about, we went with cavity slider, right? This is their ultimate and it's for six inch framing. Now they have a four inch version. It's not called ultimate. You can go on their website, you can uh, pick it, but they do have a two by four wall option. We needed the two by six option because we had this bearing wall, six inch post, et cetera, et cetera here. So we went with the um, much deeper frames. So you can see here, it's basically made, they have the end studs, if you will. And these end studs actually have a channel. I got a piece right here, let me pull this up. So you can see, and one of the things about this that's pretty neat is, uh, you know, the finished carpenter that installed these, he basically just cut these on the chop saw. So it's, uh, pretty easy to do, but you can see here, there is that fin here, but look at that really close. Not only is it a fin that comes out that receives the drywall here, but it's actually slightly canted towards the inside. And what that does is it ensures that this top edge is the very first thing to hit that drywall. So this is that piece here that we're looking at here. So. The drywall basically comes in, it goes up against that flange, that flange is slightly bent inward so that we get a really nice tight edge there. And then you can see, we basically have these lateral supports here, just goes together really nicely, right? You, you give them the size of the door, 
the thickness of the door, the thickness of the wall. One of the other options that we're going on here is we have a soft open and a soft close option on these doors. So it's not gonna go banging into there. It's gonna go into maybe an inch or two away and, uh, and then slide in nice and easy. And if I remember, we'll do a little quick demonstration when we uh, have them fully installed and everything's all trimmed out. We'll come over here and we'll play a little bit more with those doors. But you can see it has a solid track on the bottom and it also has you know a solid track up on top with a extremely solid rail up on top here, which is probably the most important part of the door because that rail, that's where that little dolly with the wheels ride, right? And so I have this weight of the door, inch and three quarter door, but understand it's not just the weight of the door. This is a very dynamic door, right? People are opening and closing it all the time. So it's always trying to move this beam, if you will, that carries the dolly. So this piece here has to be a, a pretty stiff and yeah, it's not going anywhere. So these, you know, these here, this is really sturdy, but understand once you put the drywall up, that's gonna reinforce this sturdiness. But this, you really don't have that luxury here. So we install that door and uh, drywall over that and we get a beautiful little pocket door here that's gonna last forever. Now. Before we part on this, I just wanted to show you one thing, which I see a lot of manufacturers doing it now. Um, certainly cavity sliders did it, but you can go and look at this, right on their QR code, I can pick it up and I can go right to their assembly instructions, right? So I didn't have to go home, I didn't have to download anything, I didn't have to print it. I can watch a video on installation, I can get their uh, you know, instructions here, and a lot of uh, manufacturers are now doing that. So we can get that information right out here on a job site. Basically, instead of sending a booklet or whatever that gets torn and lost, you get that, you can jump online, watch the video, get all the little tips and tricks right from Cavity Slider on their units. So like I said, people, a lot of people say, hey, Steve, can we put pocket doors? Some clients wanna put them on every doorway, right? Because the beauty of a pocket door is that it basically slides in the plane of the wall, right? There's no door swinging out here that we have to worry about parking um, that door or swinging into the hallway, that, that door goes here. Now, when clients come to me, I'm not a big fan of you know pocket doors in some locations, but let's talk a little bit about these locations. There's a big opening here. This big opening is actually gonna be a glass wall, and that's gonna be the home office for one of the owners there, right? So when we're in the design, one of the things they wanted to talk about was, you know, we have our office there. These are all bedrooms. Well, what if somebody's out here watching TV or whatever, and someone is, some guests are staying in the room here and they wanna sleep in late or they wanna be able to go use the bathroom at free will and not basically be seen from the rest of the house. This pocket door basically closes off the bedroom wing to the public space. And it would be what I would consider the public space there, this being a semi-private space until I close that door. And that would make that what I would term a private space, right? So that you can maneuver through there. Now, you can see we have back-to-back -back pocket doors here. This one here is, the owner suite is just outside this door. And this is one of the offices for the owner. So we put basically this back door in at the office so you could get quick run into the owner suite or come out into the office if you wanted to grab something, you wouldn't have to go around. Um, or you could sneak into the office without being seen by anybody in the public space. So, you know, really good use of pocket doors there, using them in there to uh, grab those two locations. So. I just wanted to touch on that a little bit. We jumped over here to the laundry room because I want to talk to you a little bit about what you, you would think maybe is atypical to a construction site, but it's probably more typical than we want it to be, right? And, and more typical than you would believe it to be. So we have a two by four wall here and notice 
these are set up for our six inch cavity sliders here, right? Now, the reason for that in reviewing the hardware for the sliders, we felt more appropriate to go with the six inch ultimate cavity slider to get a little bit more strength and a little more beefiness to that system. And so the decision was, yes, let's go with the six inch cavity slider and we'll just pad this wall out. So you can see here, this is a little wider than the two by four wall there, but we'll just get the electrician and the, the framer. He's gonna pad this out. We'll move that box out, but then we'll have that six inch pocket door here, their ultimate, you know, much stronger system. Now we're in the laundry room, quick little tidbit about that. Typically laundry rooms are what I would call a double loaded room, right? I walk in, there's a center aisle, there's something that's happening on the right, there's something that's happening on the left. Closets, for example, um, you know, master closets in the owner suite, laundry rooms, that's a pretty typical layout. We have the washer, dryer, a cabinet with the laundry sink, and then we have cabinetry on the other side with some upper cabinetry there. So we need a door that enters in. It's very rare that anybody really wants a swinging door that blocks 30% of the cabinetry or that swings in front of the laundry cabinet. And the other thing about these doors is that there's not a high degree of privacy there, right? There's some acoustical performance that you need to consider, but there's no high degree of privacy. Like, hey, somebody's in there and they, they can't be seen or heard um, for whatever reason. So a pocket door in a laundry room is actually a pretty darn good solution. Cause as you can see here, we can put the door, it stays in the plane of the wall, slides into the pocket. And now I just simply walk in and again, washer and dryer on the right, laundry tub. And then on the left, we have the ability to bring all of our cabinetry right up to the side of the cavity slider here and fit that in. And we'll have a very successful laundry room. You see behind the scenes here, we're drywalling and then we're gonna jump in and we're gonna hang some uh, doors. We're gonna put in some baseboard and we're talk gonna talk about the trim work on the inside of the house. So let's get going. All right, build show. So we're inside one of the rooms. We got Glenn from Custom Home Finish. Don't let that door fall on no, me. No, sir. So, uh, so Glenn, let, before we get started here, we're gonna hang a door. We're yep. gonna run through all of the uh, the pieces, but before we get into that, tell me a little bit about Custom Home Finish and uh, a little bit about Glenn. Well, there's a lot about Glenn. <laughs> no, we just, uh, we do trim, we do high-end trim, we do a lot of built-ins, we do a lot of, uh, we do a lot of trim, a lot of coffered ceilings and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. And I'm assuming All you guys are really stuff. busy, right? Uh, super busy, yeah. You guys do stairways too? Yep, stairways, everything interior. Awesome, awesome. And uh, how long y'all been in business? So Kevin and I have been in business for a little over 13 years, but I've been doing it for 25. 25. So how does somebody get into becoming a trim carpenter? A lot of times it's usually a trade school, but I actually ended up getting a job just through a friend who needed someone to help out and I stuck with it. Okay. All right. And uh, obviously you love it. I mean, I one of my favorite things is seeing trim go in and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really interesting in construction that you go through and we've been going through these all of these episodes from the time we tore down the original house but up until now we've been pretty much making something and then hiding it yeah right right yeah. we're finally getting to put something in that is going to stay where we can see it right so i always say like this is you know we're over the hill this is all the important stuff so you got a really important job here because you have to make me look good well that's the fun right? of it i mean that's and yeah. that's a challenge if you ask my wife um, but, uh, so first off, we're going to install a door. Sure. So these are Brockway Smith, uh, Brosco, Brosco. Yep. Which is, isn't that Brockway Smith company? Yep. It's just short. Brosco is the short version. These are an MDF paneled door. They're what I would call a shaker panel, right? And this is a single panel. Um, it has what I would term square sticking and the square sticking is the 90 degree angle here. Sometimes you can get these as raised panel. Sometimes you get, what's the, is it Ovalo or uh, there's a name for that um, molding. That's oh, almost like a glass bead. Yeah, yeah, it's, you can get some beaded, but they also have, yeah, there's a, a molding here that you can get. So there's, there's different profiles. In a contemporary house like this, 
you know, that square sticking really kind of gives you that knife-like edge, very simple. Clean. Clean, um, you know, uncomplicated, which is pretty much, you know, a contemporary house. Now, this has come pre-hung. Yep. And pre-hung means that it's already inside the frame. Sometimes you can get right. the door frame and then hang the door later, meaning cut in the hinges, et cetera. But we have our hinges cut in already. We're going with polished chrome, desire of the client. Um, might not be in favor of it. I'm highly in favor of it because I am so sick of seeing satin nickel or black, <laughs> black. right? I mean, those are like 99% of the choices. And I think a lot of times people don't pick things because they like it. They pick things so they don't have to argue against it. Right? Oh, I'll just pick satin nickel. Everybody likes yeah. satin nickel. Yeah. I won't get any heartache. But, you know, our clients here, they don't have a problem. And I actually like it. Years ago, I did a project where we had polished chrome in the kitchen. And I kind of raised an eyebrow to the homeowner. She's like, well, I really like it. And we put it in. And, oh, my God, it looked beautiful. The kitchen cabinets. It was like going to my grandmother's house. But anyways, I know. I, I get off tangent here and I got to. Tell all my little stories, but pre hung door. We also have some of the casing already installed. Yeah, like so hang one by four. On. Yep. Um, but we didn't hang the top piece, so no. that gives us the flexibility to rack the door, right? And or, then you can also fit the header in the. So and it's then nice fit and the tight. header in. But one thing I did notice is, is you have these already grooved yep. for a biscuit. Yep. So we don't just, you know, for the do it yourselfers out there that want to just take the one by four, nail it up, put a board across here, and then nail it up, you run the risk of that joint opening. Yeah, it will separate pretty quick. Right, and so gluing it with biscuits and, and such, you know, I'll give you a little story, not that I'm a professional, but when I trimmed my own house, I did the biscuit, I put the piece, I put the pieces on, I nailed it at the top two, and I left the rest of the board free yep. until that I came back the next day and then I would nail it off and get the reveal. So I guaranteed that that joint would solidify before I started racking this against it. Right. So um, that was my little tip. Um, but anyways, let's go through uh, installing the door. All right. If, we, if you don't mind, I'd love to go through the numbers because I know it's just not slide it in the hole, nail it off, and we're done. No, you got to do some there's, things. There's some things. There's some so things. So let's put it in, and uh, I'm not going to coach you, but I might ask some questions along sure. the way. Sure. Now, the first thing that comes to mind is I notice the door is up a significant height there. Obviously, yep. we're putting in a three-quarter inch hardwood floor yep. here. So you have to make preparation for that. I mean, we could pull the door off if we had to. And cut it later and, on. And cut it later. But obviously, the more times we do extra steps, right. somebody's losing money on that. Either the client's losing money by paying more, or you're losing money because I'm you've just added around. five hours to the house right. and, and the work. So I'm assuming we've already pre-cut that and set that up on the bottom. They usually come an inch and a quarter. Okay. Already ready to go. This gives you a half inch over the flooring, okay. which is really good because sometimes the flooring is not perfect. If the level. flooring isn't perfect, then, right. and you have to remember, it's not just about what's happening right below the door. This 32 inch door is gonna swing in. So it matters out here where Glenn's standing. Right what the floor is doing too. If there's a slight hump or a beam underneath or something where that's not perfectly level, that's gonna create havoc there. So, so we have that, you slide it in the opening. Talk to me, Glenn. Grab a level. We wanna make sure that the door is plumb straight up and down so that it swings nice and easy. Okay. Sometimes you gotta move it a little bit in the opening. to make sure you get it right there. But you're also gonna make sure that your reveals are gonna be good too. Right. Yeah, we don't want it rubbing on one of those corners. Right. So there. you nail off hinge side. Okay. And for those of you, you know, not familiar with framing, you have to remember on the side here, we have two two-bys that are beyond the rough opening. So 
we have three inches of framing lumber in there. So that's basically what he's nailing into. He's not nailing into a vacancy in the wall. He's basically nailing into what we would call the trimmer or jack and the king stud. So go ahead, Glenn. So now we need to make sure the reveal up top is good also. So right here, you want to try to keep at least three sixteenths. Okay. You know, so that when the door is painted, because the door will shrink when it's painted, it will take up some room. And you try to keep that. Which is a really good tip. I don't know if you caught that, but he was talking about having a decent reveal there so that when you paint it and you put that finished coat on, the door gets dimensionally larger. So if that reveal is really, really tight, then you run the risk of it rubbing and basically rubbing your finished paint job off. So, so now the door is ready to be shimmed. You want to get it a little snug. Okay. Not super tight. All right. And so basically you don't want to, I mean, you went through the, the, the whole exercise of leveling that, exactly. plumbing it. The last thing you want to do is come in and put start a shim and then start bowing that out. Yep. So you want to maintain that. Do we do a double check with a level on that or? Uh, you won't need to because this jam is pretty sturdy gotcha. and I'm not, I'm not pushing it. You're not at pushing it. on it. You're just you know? snugging it I up. just want it snug. Gotcha. And then once we do that, through the jam into the stud and it holds it. I gotcha. And it's gonna keep our and door. And then you do that, do we do that in multiple places down the door here? Yep, or? so I'll do the two tops and then I'll do the two bottoms. When I close the door, make sure it's hitting well on this strike. So see how it's open a little bit up top. Gotcha. I would take and shim this here. Just snug. You want to make sure this is straight. Put one nail. Now she's hitting good all the way up and down. Yeah, and so what we're really checking for here is that you want to make sure that if it's hitting the stop, which is this yep. piece here down there, that it's not, you know, a quarter of an inch away exactly. here. You want it to be snug against the all stop. around it. So now when we go to put our hardware in, the final adjustment on the hardware will ensure that the door gets fully seated against that stop. Exactly. Awesome. And then of course you trim these off and then yep. we'll put the face trim on. We still got a little bit of plaster um, to go here, but uh, so with that now, we have our jam there, we have our baseboard, yep. um, and uh, we're gonna show how you mark that up, get that ready. Um, if you remember in our electrical rough, we chose to put all of the outlets, um, you can see them down here, down in the baseboard. And so our baseboard is gonna be such that it comes in here like that in that outlet is set up to be in the center of the board there. Now, <clears throat> one of the things, we tried to get our baseboard here on time. We're, uh, we missed it by about a day. So Glenn took the time and made up a piece of baseboard for us. This is exactly dimensionally accurate to the baseboard that we're getting, but they're just running, you know, a couple thousand linear feet of that and um, getting it delivered to us. So it's not here, but we have that. If you wanna run through the uh, um, exercise of how do we make sure that we didn't cut the hole here when the outlet is over there. Sure. Well, yeah, let me grab this and then uh, we'll get it mocked up. All right. All right, Glenn, first of all, now I feel like management. I get to sit <laughs> here and watch you work. Great. Right? So, um, all right, so we have our outlet. Yep. They've been predetermined. We set those on blocks on top of the framing. If you missed it, go check out the electrical rough. We talked about it, but now we're about to prepare our baseboard for it. So walk us through the steps. Well, you wanna make sure that you know where it is because when you put this down over it, you can't gone. see it, all right? So what I like to do is just carry these lines up lightly. When you say lightly, what you mean is light enough so the painter, when he primes and paints, it doesn't, come through. It doesn't bleed through. That's what he means by lightly. 
Because you get some people, they would, oh, they'll use a black Sharpie, but hey. they would do it lightly. Right? Now we can mark right on the top. Top. Okay. Well, that's going to be. And then we'll bring it over to the saw. Okay. We're going to mark down. And so you just take what measurements off the floor. Exactly. So we're going to go off the floor. Set two and five eighths to four and three quarters. Okay. And we'll cut that out based on that. And then you'll come back and you'll have that. Uh, we'll have that board. Those yeah. are always, those are the cool when you're demoing and remodeling a house, pulling stuff off and seeing all the, the marks measurements and all that. And the measurements. <laughs> yeah. That's the cool part. So, all right. Go get it ready. We'll Let's be here. Get it done. Sure. All right, Glenn. So we got you it. cut it. Yep. This is the moment of truth, Glenn. This is where like five million people realize Glenn's either legit or he's not. So well, let's prove it to us. Let's see how it did. Pretty well spot. Glenn's legit. That looks good, man. That yep. looks good. Nice and tight against the casing. It I'm looks nice it. and tight. I like the way that this, you know, fades back a little above the saw cut. Yeah. Just enough that, you know, one of the things down at that full three quarter inch, it's nice that that uh, is a little slimmer. And, you know, I like that detail in the baseboard. Now, notice the bottom here is a little bit thicker than that. For those of you that are sitting there and saying, wow, you guys screwed up. It's not centered. You have to remember, we have three quarter inch flooring going down that's gonna eat up out of that. So when we're finally done with the assembly, the outlet's gonna pretty much sit in the center of the meat of the board down at the bottom there. So um, just wanted to point that out. So <clears throat> Glenn, that's, uh, I don't know what to tell you, man. We did it. You're, you're, we did it, you're legit. Um, before we go, Glenn also, he installed a couple doors here. I just wanted to talk, talk through those. I mean, we installed it there. You can see these are our shaker panels. These are a pair, right? When I, when I do layouts, <clears throat> one of the issues in bedrooms and closets, one, I hate bypass doors. Um, I know a lot of guys say, oh, we just put a six foot bypass in. I hate them because unfortunately, like they come out of sync, they're out of whack. They're just always a pain. I love hinge doors, but to come in here and say, put in two 36 inch hinge doors, you have to remember this is, this is a really good sized bedroom, but we don't have, you know, 30 feet here where we can waste it on having a door and being able to walk around. So when you put a king size bed in and it comes to here, we want to make sure they're sized appropriately. So going to the double door, when we pull this open, right and the bed stops here we still have some space rather than having the door out here so i like going through the double doors here um, in the closet now these have magnetic catches yeah i mean you usually i'm you still used to seeing like the little ball spring and i have that at my house and the damn thing keeps popping out I yeah mean, these, these they are last way about better. two years right and i have to buy a new one um, but these have the receivers already in the door and these are just little covers that come on that yeah you can take those off they oh, actually so stick they, they're screwed in that's yeah. actually pretty cool yeah those are screwed in and same so with the ones in the door they're screwed in and yep. then this is just a cover that makes it look nice and finished there right and then of course as these go you can see and they hold it pretty good it catches it and pulls it in and holds it in the place there and then we have our door there we're ready for some hardware um, we'll get the painters in here. It just so happens the painter is here. So we're going to walk through and talk about how does he prep plaster? How does he prep wood? How does he prep the doors? All of these things. And uh, we're going to continue on. Glenn, all I can say is you did it, man. All right. You made me proud. So thank you. You got it. Thank you for all the guys at Custom Home Finish that uh, are going to make this place look awesome. I'm sure in the future videos as we walk through and we talk with the electrician and the plumber and we're putting in flooring. You're going to see all of Glenn's handiwork throughout the house. So exciting stuff. Let's uh, get that painter in here and let's talk painting. 
Hey, Bruno. How's it going, Steve? How you doing, buddy? Good, good. Let him, thank you for coming out. So, yeah. for those of you, meet Bruno. All right, Steve Bazek, Arger Deck, we just went through. We talked about hanging a door. We talked about the baseboard. Glenn did a beautiful job, by the way. Um, I'm not going to say he was nervous because it never came through, but it was, I think, his first time on camera. So he did a really good job. So, Bruno, you own Alta Home. Yes. And Alta Home is a? It's a painting company. A painting company. Yes. So you're here, you're responsible for all the painting. Yes. Inside, outside. I mean, we have some pre-finished stuff, but we're still going to have some staining on the outside, some cleanup work. I'm sure you're in tune with that on every project, yes, right? Yes, of course. Hey, can you... Can you do that? So let's talk first. We have plastered walls here. If you haven't seen the video, go check it out. Mike did a beautiful job talking us through, but for all of you that live outside of New England, this conversation might not make as much sense to you because you're just painting dry, drywall. But Bruno, being the expert that he is, is gonna walk us through what we have here. And then if there's anything that you would do differently if this was drywall, then throw that out because we have a lot of viewers here that are out in the Midwest and they don't do plaster out there. Yeah, yeah. Right, so, so we have our veneer plaster here. Where do we go from here? All right, so veneer plaster, uh, there's a lot of water that, that goes into to make this super smooth. Uh, so we use a, a mensary primer which uh, helps to hide all the pH level. It has a lot of pH level to hide okay. all the water imperfection. So this is such a smooth surface. All that we do is we only prime it. And then after the priming, we just do a little scuff sand and then we can just apply the finished coat on it. The finished coat on there. And so talk to me a little bit of, let's say the plaster finished on Monday. Like how many days do you give yourself for the plaster before you think it's ready to come in and put a primer on it? Yes, after he, he finishes on Monday, we wait about uh, five days to a week uh, okay. to make sure that the water is all fully dried uh, from, from the walls. Yeah, and that's probably a seasonal thing. It is. Right? In July, it probably takes a little longer because there's no place for the moisture to go. In February, the walls probably dry out a heck of a lot faster. Yes. But a week, good rule of thumb there. And then the primer, you said it's a latex primer. It's a latex primer. And then the finish coats, two. The finish coat is also latex. Two, and do you have a paint preference? Uh, usually Sherwin Williams or Benjamin Moore. Okay. Um, and whichever brand the client wants. We walk, walk through with the client, pick out the colors, and then we have that. So, so, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Ceiling, same thing? Same thing. Right, it gets one coat of latex, two coats of, of paint there. But when we're doing doors, now doors and trim, this is where the game changes a little. And you know, it's, it's interesting here because we have some options that I think a lot of viewers would sit there and say, oh, I'd never do that. But we just had the conversation of, you know, the doors are um, already pre-done or kind of almost finished, I would say, right? They're gonna need one more coat, probably get cleaned up a little. Um, obviously you would take those off of the hinges. Yes. And take them into another room, clean them up. Um, you know, I'll tell you a horror story. We were doing a house, the homeowner says, oh, I'll paint all the doors. They painted all the hinges. I thought the Finnish carpenter was gonna like start a fight. He was so aggravated. Um, but, but these, the doors, is there anything that we do other than just clean these up and apply a finished coat to them? Uh, yes, yeah, so when we paint doors, right? We, um, let me open this one here to make it easier. Uh, we remove the doors from the hinges Okay. And we usually take the pin out. Yep. That way, when we put them back, it's not going to affect the way it's actually installed, right? We do a little bit of sanding just to remove the roughness of the door. Gotcha. And then we usually spray the doors. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, and that's just one coat? Two coats. Two coats. Okay, yes. spray it, then I give it a quick inspection, and then hit it with the finished coat, and then put it up until nobody touch it again. Yes, correct. Until you're, until you're done. Now, the trim here, this is a popular trim. We're going with a very simple, this is a contemporary house, so just a simple one by four. Um, but in talking with you and the general contractor and the client, we opted to go with raw wood here, not something that's pre-primed. And this is where I'm saying, some of you viewers might sit there and say, oh, I'd never do that. I, you, got, you should have just got pre-primed to save you a lot of time. But according to you and your experience, you'd rather have this. Yes. 
So raw wood, uh, what is good about raw wood? We can actually sand it better, right? We can round all the edges because it's a sharp edge yep. after install. Um, if you have pre-prime, most of the times they're not rounded either. So we have to sand it either way and then prime it again to gotcha. make sure it's going to be smooth. So the goal is uh, we, we sand everything, we fill the holes, sand. And, and when you say fill the holes, you know, we have a lot of listeners here. Some of them might not be in tune with construction, but what do you typically use as a hole filler? We use a uh, wood filler. Okay. Uh, very simple wood filler uh, and make sure the holes are covered. And then after it's dry, we just sand them off. Sand it all off yeah. and got it. Okay. All right. And, but you like that raw wood because you can just deliver a better product in the end. Yes, correct. Especially with poplar, it's such a grainy wood. When we prime it, we like to use oil-based primer. Gotcha. Because if we just use a regular latex and then put like a white trim, for example, <coughs> as a top coat, over time it can yellow. Okay. You know, the wood can change, the color can change. I gotcha. So the oil-based primer kind of, it just, I won't say guarantees, there's no guarantees in life, but it's, it's an aid to keep that white nice and white throughout the years. Correct, yes. Right, and, and we're doing an oil-based primer and then you finish it with a couple of coats of latex. Latex. And that's only where we have the raw wood here. And our baseboard, it's gonna be the same thing. We're gonna have raw poplar. Now, some guys would elect to do um, pine if we paint it, but in our conversations with you, you also suggested that your preference would be poplar over pine. Yes. Right, is yes. there a reason why, like why would I choose that? It's more sturdy. You know, it, it's, um, it, it stays more. Uh, the pine usually, you know, after install can move around depending on the house. Okay. Uh, so this is far more stable. Much more meaning stable. Meaning the joints and, and, you know, just the shrinkage of the ability to take on moisture and expand or shrink. Um, but I think, you know, I've heard in the past too that the poplar, even though it has some graininess to it here, the pine really would show it more than the poplar. Like it's a little easier to hide on the poplar. Yes, correct. Right, so we get, again, we get that better finish that doesn't yellow and stays for a very, very long time. So, um, no, that's, that's awesome. Now, we're not doing it here, but if we were staining it, right, for those that are sitting out there and saying, hey, you talked about paint, but what if I wanted to stain it? If we were staining this and say this was a white oak door and white oak trim, how would you treat that? Is there anything that you would do? Yes, so same thing. Uh, we will sand the whole wood. Yep. Um, if we're staining this, of course you wouldn't stain poplar if it was uh, oak. Right. Uh, sand the whole wood, round everything up. Then we will condition the wood. Okay. All right. And condition the wood, you mean like there's some kind of liquid or an application that we put on yes, it? Yes, we'll apply it, you okay. know, to condition the wood, so to get at the true, the true grain of the wood, right? And then okay. we will apply the stain. Okay. And then we will do one coat of the poly. After the one coat of the poly, that's when we fill the holes. I got you. All right? The reason why is if we fill the holes before, it will mark up. You'll see the... the, the when you go to stain it, this will stain differently than the holes. Yes. Will. I yes, so then we just get like a, a matching putty of the stain to make sure the, the oil of the putty does not penetrate into the wood. So when you go to stain, the sequence changes a little. And I've often heard when people talk about, well, you need to condition it, it's almost like you're filling the pores in the wood. And, and you know, whereas if you just put the stain in, it's not gonna be consistent because some parts of the wood are more porous than others. Yes. And so the conditioning layer at the beginning allows you to get more of a uniformed stain. Yes. Awesome. Well, I don't know, do you have any closing remarks? I think we went through everything. We talked about walls, ceiling, doors, trim, baseboard. Um, next thing is, is to get your uh, people in here and just do it. Awesome, thank you. So, no, thank you. Well, there you have it, Build Show. We're in here. Our plaster's up, we're hanging doors, we're trimming it out. Bruno and his crew are right on the heels of them. We're gonna paint this out and uh, we'll be on to the next episode. All exciting stuff, everything from here on out is stuff that we're gonna see and touch the rest of the life of this house. So until next time, Steve Bezik Architect out here, Build Show Build Boston.